Lada is going to stop calling with his mother in the emergency room, which is really unfortunate. But he did, he knew that she has been ailing for a while, and he did record himself giving his talk. So we will see him, uh, we will see him give his talk. He, told, we'll, we'll, he said he might try to Skype in for the q and I said so that's not very stressful. Um, but I just see you with your mom. So we will hear some presentation, um, but I don't think he'll be joining us for the q and um, But I'm going to introduce the panel. And of course, we'll send the wishes um, to the panel. Just know that we'll so this panel, uh, to kick us off, is called Street Modernists, Urban Undoings of High and Low. And I just want to say one quick thing about it, which is that both of the people um, in the panel, Tony Moore and Fernando Mugara, are coming from a background in architectural history. And as I said in my comments, architecture is one of the disciplines that I think has really grappled thoroughly with questions of vernacular perfection. Uh, and so to me, it was really important for the two of them to come together and sort of ground us, perhaps. Talene Gregoire is a professor of art history in the Department of Art and Art History and the chair of the art history program at UC Davis. Her research focuses on the cross-pollination of visual culture and post-colonial theories, focusing on Iran and India. Her books include Contemporary Iranian Art from 2014 and Building Iran from 2009, which is an amazing book about uh, And her talk today is enigmatically entitled God is Beautiful and Who Loves Beauty. Then we'll have uh, Fernando again as a meet in, a meet in a mediated fashion. Fernando Luis Lada, Associate Professor of Architecture at the University of Texas, trained as an architect. He is also the founder of Studio Toro, a nonprofit devoted to the challenges of water conservation and urban flooding in Latin America. He writes extensively on a variety of, variety of issues regarding the Latin American built environment, including informal settlements. In 2015, he published the first comprehensive survey of modern architecture in Latin America. Our respondent for this panel is Greg Castillo, associate professor in the College of Environmental Design at UC Berkeley. His publications on Cold War design, politics, and practices in the Iran draft called Cold War on the Home Front, The Soft Power of Mid-Century Design, and essays in numerous collections and museum catalogs. Castillo was the guest curator of the installation of hippie modernism in 2017 at the Berkeley Art Museum and his big film archive. He did an amazing job of bringing that show from the walker. So please join me in welcoming uh, Tony. Wonderful to be here. All right. Beginning in 1922, under the auspices of Iran's Pahlavi dynasty, the tombs of selected historical figures were systematically destroyed to make way for a new kind of architecture that signaled secular nationalism. Initiated under the reign of Reza Shah, all but two of the projects were implemented under his son, Mohammad Reza Shah. The monuments were ideologically inscribed commemorations of the political elite of the 1920s, who not only made up the first government of the king, but also founded the Society for National Heritage, with the aim to preserve and propagate Iran's cultural patrimony. Within a matter of few years, they managed to conceive and define the political as well as cultural parameters of modern Iran. The nation state that they left behind, despite cosmetic modifications, would remain unchanged to the present day. During the six decades that followed, they constructed some 40 mausoleums, carried out 60 preservation projects, tabulated an index of historical heritage, abolished the French monopoly over Iran's archaeological sites and established a national museum and a public library. The unprecedented scope, diversity, and systematicity of these undertakings were bolstered by numerous publications, lectures, exhibitions, and invention of a tourist trade, as well as the very um, idea of national patrimony. So some of Quickly, some of the uh, famous monuments, um, the tomb of Fevdosi, the um, sort of national hero, um, um, Hafez, um, Abyssina, um, 
Om Khayyam and eventually Arthur Pope, who was an um, Orientalist. So, um, all of these are projects that uh, the, S the Society of National Heritage did. The significance of Pahlavi architecture laid in the way it instigated strategies of modernization and formulated a discourse on secular national <coughs> domain of temporal befores and afters. Despite their simplicity, the monuments incorporated a complex range of state-imposed civil practices where architecture became a vital aspect of public and secular instruction. Autopsy, autopsies of remains stood as proof of the racial superiority of the nation while the adjoining museums validated the logic of its display. The construction process harbored technically sophisticated categorization and homogenization of the public sphere. Each monument's presence in provincial towns instigated superficial revitalization of otherwise minor cities and dictated secular sociability in orthodox sociosystems. These projects also provided a platform for Western scholars to negotiate their conflicting personal and colonial ambitions. The discourse on public architecture occasioned quarrels over techniques of preservation, authenticity of heritage, and ownership of archaeological sites. Above all, what these monuments did was to present to Iranians a new national map upon which the old Shia routes of Ziyarat were utilized and obscured by the new secular sites of national pilgrimage. So here on this map, you can see the way that they are sort of building, sorry, they are building, um, which one is on the top? Is the laser pointer? Okay. Um, I don't think it works. All right, so you can see the square ones are um, uh, the um, traditional um, religious sites, whereas next to each of them, very strategically, they built a secular uh, monument in order to reroute these. Um, so religious pilgrimage became national tourism. So these are the same sites um, divided in time. Proper modern behavior and forms of sociability previously impossible in these sites now became the privileged modern middle class norm. The court and the state endorsed this in practice and in looks. While none of the SNH's projects were modernistic in style, they served modern structures of knowledge and experience. They each aimed to work as national heritage, which had to re be read as vernacular and timeless uh, as the image of the monarchy that they in enhanced. Whereas they were a part of the larger project of modernity, in fact, one could argue they were the project of modernity, they were not intended to decipher, to be deciphered as modernistic. The Pahlavi state compensated for this in other spheres of architectural practices. For example, key modernist uh, buildings um, were, for example, this uh, girls' art academy, uh, the, the Senate House um, and um, the Mehrabad Airport um, and um, the Museum of Contemporary Art, the first museum of contemporary art built outside the West for expressively for contemporary art to serve as a museum. And uh, the prayer house, um, sort of this modernist prayer house, cube within a cube. Um, so these were the, basically, these were sponsored avant-garde art. Of, um, Pahlavi architecture thus fashioned novel ways to map civil space, national time, and secular identity that performed and marked progress until the dawn of the 1979 revolution. When in June 1978, Empress Farah decreed the allocation of $2.5 million to the squatters of southern Iran, it was already too late. While liberal royalists continued to believe that her regency could save the monarchy by then no amount of urban planning or cultural engineering, however avant-garde, would prevent the toppling of the dynasty. Any subsequent attempt to stop a revolution through architecture, as Le Corbusier had prophesied, ended in failure. 
while in the sorry, um, not only had the people chosen revolution over architecture, but had co-opted architecture in their revolution. When the Islamic Republic established itself as the sole successor to the revolution, Imam Khomeini declared um, uh, law and order. His cultural revolution from 1980 to 83 intended to replace the Pahlavi man with the Islamic man, while the government marginalized Iran's pre-Islamic artistic tradition as both an ideological reaction to and a methodological imitation of the Shah's regime. It concluded an active policy of neglect towards Pahlavi sites. Both were portrayed as the age of ignorance, time of despotic kings, and era of plunder. At the expense of artist, artistic activities in the 60s and 70s, which were avant-garde, the young revolutionary artistic decided the course of art in the Islamic Republic after 1980. Those who had um, reached prominence during the Pahlavi era, even those who had participated in the anti shah struggle, were marginalized. Any formal association with Pahlavi art was detrimental. The kind of avant-garde taste promoted by the royal elite was to be shunned. The core of Iranian modern and contemporary art was thus severed because the avant-garde had been wedded completely to the institution of monarchy. Their boundaries indistinguishable. Despite his conservative and often regressive style of rulership, Muhammad Reza Shah projected the image of a revolutionary monarch at the vanguard of social change. His White Revolution, his Workers' Act, his Women's Suffrage Act, and his patronage of numerous modernistic mega-projects were aspects of this avant-garde image-making. While in the Russian case, the steady decline of the Romanovs had opened up the public space between 1905 and 1917 revolutions for the avant-garde to come to fruition in Iran, the Pahlavis fell abruptly. In light of the king's centralization policies throughout the 70s, there was neither ideological nor public space for the maturation of the avant-garde that would instigate, or at the very least represent, a political revolt. When the revolutionary momentum began, the Iranian avant-garde, with the few sporadic exceptions in poster design, was unable to muster a descending philosophy of its own. Nor did Epros Farah's personal commitment and generous patronage of both Western and Iranian avant-garde art help the revolutionary intentions of artists. During um, 1978, when the people rose against the monarchy, the avant-garde's time had lapsed. With a handful exception, leading artists followed the royal family into exile. The erasure of Pahlavi aesthetics, and by extension, ethos, one that both Pahlavi kings had cultivated since 1922, and the replacement of this with an Islamic Shia aesthetic was one, if not the most important goal of the revolution. Khomeini was clear about this um, from the outset. As early as 1941 in his Kastral Astrar, he featured cultural decadence as a cause of moral corruption and the er er erosion of Iranian identity, while blaming Reza Shah's Minister of Art and Culture. In his September 1964 speech in Rome, he warned the Pahlavi court that without cultural autonomy, no political reform would ever be possible, concluding with the characteristic ultimatum, you should create an independent culture or give us, the Shia orthodoxy, control of the culture. While the arts were the first to be affected by the revolution, the art historical definition of culture was ab uh, absent from Khomeini's philosophy of an Islamic and a Republican Iran. Just like Marx and Lenin, his instructions to artists were deliberately vague. His ambi this ambiguity pushed the visual to the center of power politics and at once cross-pollinated the visual politics of populist and avant-garde arts. Without any 
um, art historical definition of culture, the arts form and function were left to others to decide. This was often done literally. For example, Diba's prayer house in Farah Park, for instance, was replaced by a namaz a typical sort of neighborhood mosque, in the now Tulip Park. As in all things, pastiche, artistic agency remained irrelevant. So I never uh, sort of, they're very close, they're literally a few meters apart. And um, Diva's mm, prayer house was turned into a, a storage. Uh, um, <laughs> like they, they closed it off on the top, they blocked it, um, and they opened, um, they created another um, mosque just like a few steps. Um, and actually, I don't know who the architect is. We, don't know who the architect is. Hegemonic populism, including neighborhood mosques, charity parks, and martyrdom museums and murals, permeated the public sphere that bore witness to the state's effort to rectify the moral authority of an Islamic Republic while justifying the loss of half a million Iranians in a conflict between two Muslim states, Iran and Iraq. Financed by the Martyrs Foundation, here, for example, the portrait of four young men in civilian attire are aligned diagonally from the top left to the bottom right. Under each figure, the name of the martyr and the place of his martyrdom are specified. An el elderly man hovers on the top right with an inscription that identifies him as the father of the martyrs. That the absent mother has offered four sons to the cause commands empathy from the urban viewer regardless of political persuasion. Martyrdom takes a personalized identity. Actually, indivi actual individuals are depicted in the language of realism. These are reproduced from photographs that the volunteer soldiers presented to the state before entering the battlefield. Privileging the individual over the collective, martyrdom murals constitute an extension of a statewide policy to honor the dead and to justify the long and brutal war. It incorporates death notices, television shows, interviews with relatives, the press, street names, statues, um, squares, parks, buildings, museums, and countless forms of memorabilia. They were the most visible expression of state strategy of persuasive governance. On his return from exile on February 1st, 1979, Khomeini had asked to be taken to a cemetery south of Tehran. In his time, only the cemeteries prospered, he had declared, referring to Muhammad Reza Shah's reign. The country itself, he destroyed. The Imam could not have known that under his guardianship, Behesht e Zahra Cemetery would grow to become Iran's largest burial ground in history, a true necropolis. Divided into sections allocated to the martyrs of the revolution, the martyrs of the war, the relatives of martyrs, and non martyr related deaths. The cemetery is an expression of state effort to regulate Iranian society. It is an archetype of the mercantile mechanics of rationalization, individualization, and bureaucratization of the Islamic Republic after Khomeini's death. So this always reminds me of Disneyland. <laughs> no, the, the map is almost identical. To the mercantile bourgeoisie who uh, financed the Second Republic under President Rafsanjani from 1989 to 79, so after Khomeini's death, populist art had a particular appeal. Acting as patron of kitsch helped the bourgeoisie to distinguish itself from its equally capitalist and oligarchic Pahlavi predecessors. Kitsch projected a fitting um, image of its populist background and practices of sociability and articulated a coherent version of otherwise contradictory new agendas. The merchant, mercantile bourgeoisie's insistence on looking just like everyone else despite its newfound wealth and power. The state's resolves to institutionalize power and stabilize life under the Second Republic while 
continuing to create the Islamic man and Orthodox Shia ideals, and the constitutional commitment to private property within the increasingly centralized reformulation of the nation state. But the potential for class conflict caused by this shift was displaced onto re relations among things through the new ethos of uh, amateur art and mass consumption. Behesh de Zahra was cast as the epicenter of this populist solidarity. The 400 hectare master plan is designed so that it, its northern tip connects to the historical cemetery um, to Khomeini's opulent and Disney-esque mausoleum. Carefully numbered and color-coded, it is conceived as an ideal city. In keeping with its namesake, Benj de Zahra refers to the paradise of Imam Hussein's mother and wife of Imam Ali, Fatima Zahra. The plan is punctuated by squares, memorials, amenities, and uh, fountains, including the blood fountain symbolizing the blood of the martyrs. So this is very interesting. So when I visited, I was so disappointed. <laughs> um, like, where's the blood? I can't walk. Uh, but but I, I didn't have um, time to really formulate this. But there is something very um, sort of, there's the real, sort of the uh, hyper real, the real that does not have a copy. Uh, or the, the copy that does not have an original. Um, so this blood, um, very real. And when you enter the, uh, sort of, this is the introduction to the cemetery, the gate to the cemetery, where you actually see dead soldier, like the blood is still there, photographed. And this sort of, the realism is there, and then um, sort of then you actually see other photographs, in large photographs of the guy, the soldier. Um, the captain who just died. Uh, so there's the him before and him after. Um, um, so, but I didn't have, so there's a lot there that I haven't tapped in. The collection of tightly muted uh, graves act as an open air, do it yourself memorial museum. Loved ones, largely female relatives of Marty's, curate the glass fronted cupboards on top of each tombstone. The metal case are mass produced by the Tehran municipality. In them, all sorts of personal, official, and practical objects are exhibited. Photographs, copies of the Quran, uh, plastic flowers, flower pots, the national flag, personal items, gift wrapping, certificates, and other symbolic artifacts are arranged. So this one is interesting. You, you'll see uh, many of them have this plastic bottle there. And the purpose is that. So it's sort of, a, it's just also a storage. So they keep it there so that mothers and sisters, when they visit, they can actually wash the, um, um, the tomb. While scrupulously ca uh, cared, they uh, reproduce the populist taste endorsed by the state. So there is an alliance between what is propagated um, in state level and these very personal um, museum um, curations. In the excitement of the reconstruction and the beautification of the, of the 1990s after the war, under President Khatami, many artists returned to the war to point to its lingering consequences. Tabakolian's Mother um, of Martyrs powerful photograph uh, series did that by bringing her audience face to face with survivors who continue to bear witness to the war's violence against the state's praise of martyrdom. The women holding the portraits of their sons some thir three decades after their death loops back to another endless end. The Bench de Zahra Cemetery, wherein these same women act as artists in creating the display cases for the memory of their sons. Nowhere is the absurdity of normalcy brought more clearly under limelight, nor are the margins between the high and the low so blurred. 
um, through the painstaking uh, process of curating these mini museums, um, disenfranchised women entered the narrative of the war. So this is an artist, an avant-garde artist, who is inspired by these, um, um, these cases. Uh, Hassan Sadez Tahdi takes its aesthetic cue from the cases cross-pollinating civil space, martyrdom, amateur women artists, and I would say Sotheby's. Holding a bouquet of daffodil in her hand and a vase of plastic flower in the other, the author of the 2003 bestseller, Reading Lolita in Tehran, Azar Nafisi, had asked her students at Tehran University, what is kitsch? At times during the writing of my book on contemporary Iranian art, I wondered why plastic flowers were food forbidden in my grandparents' house. What is wrong with plastic flowers? And I am dying to put plastic flowers in my balcony because the real ones keep dying and I don't have time. But, but my ethical upbringing does not allow me. Um, I con conjured upon Nafis's reason for asking that question and wondered about her student's answer. Could it have something to do with the street art uh, to which Nafisi and her students had witnessed during uh, the first decade of the revolution? Could it have something to do with Behesh e Zahra? Or perhaps with the murals and billboards that about God is beautiful and he loves beauty. Under these inscriptions, I often found illustrations of bouquet of red tulips and pink roses. What has this to do with the history of contemporary art? There are no plastic flowers in Emmanuel Kant's analysis of aesthetic judgment because the first man-made plastic was displayed at the Great London Exposition in as late as 1862. However, Kant does mention artificial flowers. To tie Kant to Nafisi by way of artificial flowers as kitsch is, anachronis is an anachronism. For the word kitsch is a 19th century invention. But then again, Kant applies the adjective vanity to his artificial example which might not be a bad approximation to our own fake flowers. Kant's analysis of the intellectual interest in the beautiful reveals a correlation between the reproduction of roses on the billboards and the society that it aims to acculturate. An ethical system like the Islamic Republic that upholds a moral responsibility in its governance of the people gives um, birth to an aesthetics of populism. In order to validate its ethical obligation, Kitsch then strives to produce the effect of the beautiful. Within the system then, the arts of propaganda are collective and appeal to the emotions of the onlooker. The official appeal to God's beauty uh, was pulled into the 2009 presidential campaign and the ensuing popular uprising of the Green Movement. A poster, so I took a picture of this uh, poster, the boyfriend said, don't take her face, um, uh, right on the eve of the election. It refers to, of course, my, Michelangelo's fresco, the creation of Adam, Subverting gender roles, um, the hand of God and Adam are substituted with female hands um, um, that carry a green band on their wrist. The green calligraphy reads, you'd come aboard, Mir Hossein Musavi. This appeal to the divine beauty is embedded in and informed by multiple narratives, both theo theological and art historical from the Quranic uh, reference to God's love of beauty, to the Christian depiction of divine beauty in the Sistine Chapel, to the secular practice of voting. The combination of green stained fingertips of the elect election banner held by the cam campaigner with her meticulously French manicured nails speaks to Mirzoyev's claim that visual culture does not depend on pictures themselves, but the modern tendency to picture or visualize experience. 
In Iran's case, it is not just about the visualization of one's own postmodernity, but that of appropriating the other. The iconographic contradictions, confusions, and uh, appropriations are multi-layered and meaningful. The green color of Prophet Muhammad and Musavi's campaign, the green fingertips of the classical signifier of democratic election, the ring on one finger as placing the image in a specific context, the implication of the divinely ordained election, and the youth joining a movement beyond simple bureaucratic uh, procedures. So the election campaign mirrored Iran's uh, contemporary art. No radical manifestos, no differing, differing agendas. Instead, a pictorial discourse of signs, symbols, uh, inferences to futures, references to history, and a color-coded street and banners. Ten days before the election, on June 2nd, 2009, the leading professional art journal attendees published a solid green cover. Blatant yet minimalist, it expressed the art community's united support for Musavi. When the opposition claimed that the June 12 election had been rigged, people poured into the street. Four days later, the Guardian Council concluded that there was no irregularity in their vote. That evening, Tandis released its next issue. The cover faithfully reproduced Magritte's The Treachery of Images. In Magritte was um, ideal for Iranian purposes, for he had been employed by the advertising companies to design posters, windows, and ads in the 1920s Brussels. The treachery of images not only spoke of the pictorial priorities of the election, but also symbolized the cross-pollination of the street kitsch and the studio avant-garde, of the commercial and the political the trained artist and the amateur. That the art community published Sunetaz and Peep in answer to an election result that was not what it claimed to be spoke to the art historical ignorance of the censors at the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance. After all, there is nothing to see here. This is nothing but a pipe. Thank you very much.
Uh, this is Fernando Lara. I recorded this uh, audio with a slide presentation in case something doesn't work well with Skype uh, today. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers, Julia and Maureen, for inviting me to this seminar and for being generous enough to allow me to present uh, remotely uh, today. Uh, also, Greg Castillo, who I think is there on this session today. Uh, it's been a while, it's great to be uh, virtually in contact with you today. So thank you so much to uh, UC Berkeley for the invitation. Uh, I'm gonna talk about how modernism modernist vocabulary became, the vernacular became so popular and so widespread in Brazil. That's the uh, topic of my dissertation uh, many years ago and uh, a book and a few articles. Uh, so uh, bear with me as I read the paper and uh, show you the slides. Uh, modern and vernacular how Brazilian mid-century architecture problematizes this inherent contradiction. From a North American perspective, the words modernism and vernacular seem incompatible. We have learned from architects and scholars as diverse as Robert Venturi, Habrakian, or UC Berkeley's own Del Upton, that irreconcilable differences between modern architecture and popular taste prevented modernism from engaging with the vernacular. And even when the United States seemed to embrace modern architecture, the infatuation only lasted for about 15 years after World War II, as we are reminded by Beatrice Colomina, a mere dalliance in architectural time. The language of modernism, to use a linguistic metaphor, was never spoken long enough by the population at large to stand a chance of becoming vernacular. The relationship between architecture and popular culture is very complex, and I don't have much time to elaborate here. Let's just remember that uh, high architecture alternatively diverges from and converges with popular culture. Uh, the moments of divergence and coincidence are many, and the origins of this oscillation can be traced way back to the Renaissance uh, to Alberti, when we have the classic division between architect and builder. Uh, separated from common buildings, architecture becomes its own typology, limited, limited to structures designed by architects. So the definition of architecture as buildings designed by architects is very problematic to me. Um, such separation is crucial for the definition of architectural practice nowadays and provides the basis for, its, for the profession. Uh, it's not surprising, therefore, that architects pay little or no attention to buildings designed by anybody else, whether engineers, builders, contractors, or the owners themselves. For to do so would threaten the foundations of our professional identity. Architecture is not the only discipline marked by a complex relationship between high and low manifestations. If we follow Andreas Huysen, we see that high art and popular culture manifestations uh, have always had a volatile relationship, especially after modernity. Uh, since the 18th century, the gap between high and popular art has steadily widened, as art has increasingly become a medium for individual expression rather than a public ritual. Uh, and that is Peter Berger, the, the theories of the avant-garde. This volatile relationship culminated in the modernist avant-garde notion of using the arts to transform the practices of life. Since the exhaustion of this approach, the divide between high art and popular culture have grown even wider, and especially difficult to bridge in architecture because of the economic dynamics of the profession. Architecture is extremely expensive. As many authors point out, the division between high architecture and popular culture has never been so pronounced as after modernism. Uh, Habrakian uh, states that the modernist era was the first in history where the dialogue between fields, as he conceptualizes regular buildings, and architecture, the ones designed by architects, was disrupted. Uh, 
Then is Scott Brown also wrote decades ago that architects are still reacting strongly against the notion that mundane local examples may have something to teach them. Uh, working against this dichotomy and hoping to preserve local cultures from the threat of universalizing currents, Kenneth Frampton articulated in the early 1980s the idea of critical regionalism. According to Frampton, universal trends should be filtered through and combined with local influences to generate an architecture that can respond to both local culture and universal civilization. While I agree with the core of Frampton's argument, I believe it has been misused and misinterpreted to the point of being completely undermined. Instead of promoting the value of regional architecture, critical regionalism has singled out for praise a few, very few, hand-picked architects, elevating them to the status of cultural representatives. Mario Bota in the south of Switzerland, Alvaro Cid in Portugal, John and Patricia Patkal in British Columbia, Ricardo Legorete in Mexico, and uh, our Brazilian Oscar Niemeyer uh, are said to represent entire cultures. Moreover, critical originalism operates in only one direction, from the center to the periphery, with little or no possibility for peripheral issues to influence the centers. Uh, in this respect, a vernacular modernism would be the opposite of critical originalism. Escaping the necessary filter of the informed and rational architect and operating through a distracted but no less rational non architect. A large number of buildings displaying elements of universal modernism and recombining them with local trends, selectively accepting and rejecting aspects of modernity. This is the framework for the Brazilian phenomenon that I study. Uh, but while the hybrid nature of the Brazilian disseminations aligns uh, this so-called vernacular modernism, as I call it, with Frankton Greek originalism, the main direction of influence is very different. Uh, in Greek originalism, the architect is the one to derive elements from the vernacular and rearticulate them in high art buildings. The Brazilian case is precisely the opposite. Uh, elements of high architecture are appropriated by lay people and rearticulated into the vernacular. While Frampton's Greek originalism worries about acculturation, the Brazilian vernacular modernism points to a much more complex process of transculturation. And here I'm referencing books edited by Felipe Hernandez out of Cambridge on the process of transculturation. Uh, the fact that the Brazilian middle class of the 1950s adopted modernism as their desired and fashionable style is an intriguing deviation, one worthy of investigation in the literature of 20th century architecture. With this difference in mind, I photograph about 600 modernist looking structures in middle and lower middle class neighborhoods in Brazil back in the end of the 20th century, between 1998 and 2003. The vast majority of these houses were not designed by architects, but built by the owners themselves with the help of a contractor and unskilled laborers. Yet, they demonstrate in ingenious adaptations and applications of a modernist vocabulary. When I started documenting these houses, I was first struck by the predominance of an asymmetrical trapezoid volume created by an unusual roof line, in contrast to the symmetrical pitched roof of a traditional house. While it is easy to distinguish the truly modernist houses in any particular neighborhood by the single uh, slope of the roof or the inverted roofs, uh, concrete slabs supported by thin metallic co uh, columns, bridge solace, or uh, void ceramic elements uh, that we call copper cloth. Windows also provide fine examples of the middle class selective adoption of modernist features. Whereas the building of the wealthy designed by architects have large plate glass windows, most middle class modernist uh, houses have medium sized windows. 
Their asymmetrical placement, however, emulates the high design models. Uh, rainforest concrete canopies often occur in vernacular modernist homes and are frequently supported by very thin metal columns, another feature derived directly from high design. Uh, the occurrence of such concrete slabs and metallic columns is very important for this study because these elements come directly from some of the most famous buildings in Brazil, the Pampulha buildings, which also are in Belo Horizonte here. Uh, the Alecton and John Vlash pointed out about 95% of the built environment is not designed by architects. And Brazil in the 1950s was, of course, no exception. The lack of scholarship regarding popular dissemination of modernism in Brazil and elsewhere in general might be explained by the architect's resistance to recognizing any value in structures that were not designed by one of our own. Thus, vernacular architecture is often defined by what it is not. Not high style, not designed by professionals. The question that follows centers on how the Brazilian case should be best framed, given that a vocabulary first introduced by architects was later appropriated by middle-class home builders and widely disseminated in millions of their houses. And the numbers here are in millions. Can it still be considered modern? Uh, has it really become vernacular? What explains this rare exchange between design professionals and the general public? Most important is to understand the possible exchanges between architects and the lay public, or in the words of Habrak and in Palada's children, between architecture and the field that makes this widespread dissemination possible. Generalizing beyond the Brazilian case, the issue of natural dissemination per se must also be addressed. How does it take place? What are the vectors of information? How are stylistic and spatial trends disseminated? In sum, how could an avant-garde proposal become vernacular? If modernism indeed become vernacular in Brazil, what does this development contribute to the current architectural debate? In other words, how does this unique phenomenon relate to the multiplicity of current architectural theories and proposals? Such a vernacular modernism becomes an intriguing appendix to the broader rediscovery, rediscovery of the modern movement for a number of reasons. First is the very conjunction of those two words, vernacular and modernism. The reconciliation of modernism and popular culture has been deemed unattainable by many of the scholars, mostly the postmodern generation. If modern architecture, in its roots, stressed programs and ideas uh, geared toward the masses, it did move progressively further away from popular demands. Until, by the 1970s, one of the major arguments for its dismissal was that it had never been popular. Postmodernism, with its collage of classical elements, was proposed as an alternative approach to reconciling architecture and popular taste. It is thus striking to learn that, contrary to what postmodernism have long argued, modern architecture has in fact been popular to the extent of becoming vernacular, at least in Brazil, and I suspect that in, in a smaller extent in other countries also. But not even Brazilian architects recognized the importance of this phenomenon at the time. While European and North American critics were correct in observing that modernism have never been popular in their countries. In Florida and California, the spread of the modernist vocabulary was considerably more extensive than the rest of North America. But it still did not achieve the scale or depth of dissemination across social strata that it reached in Brazil. My goal here is not to reprise the arguments of postmodernists and modernists, but to examine how Brazilian vernacular modernism can contribute to the broader debate. Although I analyzed only a few hundred houses built over a limited time span in only a few Brazilian cities, the modernist vocabulary was appropriated elsewhere. In California, for instance, we have the case study houses as another example of the dissemination of modernism. Although, 
They were designed by architects and located in large lots in a suburban pattern. Uh, it can be argued that they influenced much of what is still being built in Southern California. Arguably, similar appropriations occurred in Mexico, Turkey, and India, countries that had adopted modernism much like Brazil did. But the impressive extent of the Brazilian phenomenon and the fact that almost no architects were involved in it and the freedom with which the elements of modern architecture are recombined in the facade provide striking evidence that modernism could indeed become vernacular. And that's one of my important points. It could become vernacular if the variables were right. As Adrian Forti and Elisabetta Andreoli point out, Brazilian modernism was, in many ways, the inverse of European and North American, what I call NATO-centric modernism. Brazil's particular building challenges involved getting rid of heat rather than retaining it. The costliness of the new materials and the availability of cheap labor. With such different premises, the results inevitably were also quite different. What was unexpected and until a decade ago invisible is the fact that by blending those contradictory trends, the Brazilian working class might have fostered a unique kind of modernism, a modernism with a postmodern attitude. It is important to point out that I do not think that Brazilian vernacular modernism can be reduced to a postmodern phenomenon. The situation here is much more complex. But I do draw on Venturi and Scott Brown's, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown's argument to assert that architects should learn from Brazilian middle class houses and favela structures in the same way that they should learn from the Vegas Strip, reference to their famous book. Moreover, if one of postmodernism's main premises is that modernism has never been popular, how does the pop Brazilian vernacular modernism fit into this discussion? One answer might be that popular modernism was an isolated phenomenon, pertinent only to Brazil and with little impact on the global architectural debate. Fair enough. But to accept this answer, I would need to agree with the traditional conception of center versus periphery, uh, in which only the center is worthy of study and the periphery is without any hope of influence. Uh, another answer might be that the Brazilian phenomenon was not really vernacular, but then how does one explain the tremendous proliferation of modernist looking houses in the Brazilian cities, giving the impression that modernism swept the entire landscape? A third answer might challenge the characterization of Brazilian working class houses as truly modern. For clearly here there is a wide difference between the architect's modernism of wealthy homes and the simplified appropriation of the middle class. Uh, the middle class facades, for instance, might represent their owners' aspirations or insertion into modernity, or at least their desire to participate in it, while the four plans demonstrate their initial refusal to concede to modern life and their insistence on a traditional layout ground in the Brazilian reality of the 1950s. And I'm referring here to the fact that I documented houses in the early 50s that had a highly modern facade and a plan that was uh, almost identical to early 20th century plans. Uh, and only later in the 50s, the plans of the Brazilian houses start changing, increasing the uh, privacy levels by having a hallway separating the bedrooms from the dining room, uh, those kind of things. Uh, it's, I don't have much time to, to elaborate the, the changes in the plans here. You have to rely on the images. Uh, in the favelas, uh, cost and benefits may have driven the adoption of concrete frames and slabs, but this renders their existence no less symbolic. Uh, talking to favela dwellers and construction workers who built both the, actually built all of them, the elite houses, the middle class houses, and their own houses in their favelas, I learned that while having a concrete slab, 
a large in Portuguese over their heads means better protection, it also means being inserted into modernity. Therefore, what I propose is that we reverse the question. Instead of asking how Brazilian vernacular modernism might fit into the broader architectural debate, we might ask why modernism never became vernacular in the United States or in Europe. The answer to this question, I am convinced, must be site-specific and therefore will have less to do with any shortcomings of the modernist paradigm per se and more to do with local implementation. Uh, I'm referring here to the uh, definition that I really like by Marshall Berman, uh, Marshall Berman uh, of modernism as the artistic result of the conflict between aspirations of universal modernity or universal aspirations of modernity and local modernization. So modernity and modernization are seldom in sync. They are usually at odds with each other and modernism thrives from that, which is precisely the case in Brazil. Uh, I, I do not argue that modernism was a perfect proposal any more than I deny the repetitive nature of so many modernist buildings or the boring echoes of international style, not to mention the disastrous modernist experiments in urbanism whose legacy still haunts most of the big cities around the world. So I'm referring here to modern architecture as more transformative and more emancipatory while modern urbanism has almost always been in the side of social control, uh, gentrification and uh, optimization of profit uh, on, the, on the land profit. Uh, instead, I'm interested in whether modernism could have become vernacular elsewhere under some of the favorable conditions that existed in Brazil. Among those conditions, I highlight uh, first, government support for modernist architecture. Uh, second, the coming together of architects around the modernist proposal. Uh, third, the media's embrace of modernization as a marketing strategy. And fourth, the middle class thirst for modernization. And fifth and last, the interactions between the realms of high and popular art. Uh, it does not seem fruitful to speculate on how those conditions could have led, have led to similar acceptance of modern architecture in the uh, NATO-centric North America and Europe world. Rather, it seems pertinent to ask in this seminar uh, whether something inherent in the modernist paradigm made it unpopular. My answer, based on the research presented here, can only be that no, there is nothing inherently unpopular in modern architecture. This should be the most important conclusion to be drawn from the study of Brazilian vernacular modernism. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, read this paper and present those images to you. Uh, I sincerely hope that Skype connections are working fine today and we will be able to uh, have this conversation. I mean, if you are uh, listening to this audio, we probably have some problems on the <laughs> Skype connection. Uh, but I hope I am reading this paper again and we can continue the conversation about uh, the, the, the popular in the arts and uh, the Brazilian case. Thank you so much.
So when I was looking through the uh, description of the symposium, uh, it struck me this uh, idea of amateurism and its uh, natural kind of falling into a category against something else, of course, which is uh, the professional. And uh, it made me immediately think of the big uh, controversy over that famous MEMA exhibition, High Low, in 1990, uh, in which uh, there was a kind of clash of trying to understand what the positioning mechanism was for uh, essentially sorting out things between high and low, in our case between the professional and uh, the vernacular, or the amateur or the DIY, which is what we saw in both of the architectural uh, uh, sort of artifacts that we saw in both of the presentations. And uh, so it, it struck me that uh, many of uh, this uh, construction of these categories uh, really are based on uh, a kind of uh, evaluative category of uh, created by connoisseurship. So a high and low, amateur and professional, kind of become associated a little bit with dominant, subordinate, the refined, the base, the civilized, the uncivilized. Uh, and it, it strikes me that a, perhaps a more productive way to try to understand the relationship of these is to look at this creative production in terms of uh, Becker's notion of uh, the art worlds within which they're created and what uh, essentially is being expressed or created within that art world. What are the connections within it? So uh, I was uh, absolutely fascinated by uh, the strange reversals that you showed in uh, the succession from a dynastic regime to the revolutionary regime. So of course in the dynastic regime we have another set of categories that are undergoing some kind of merging or, or partial reversal, which is that of contemporary architecture and archaeology, the notion of a timeless modernism, but a real manipulation of some kind of temporal categories to create a new time frame uh, as part of a narrative about a new secular form of governance. So it seems to me that that is part of the art world context of that initial inversion. And it's also uh, very interesting uh, that the art world of the dynastic regime becomes uh, part of the avant-garde. So the avant-garde cannot escape its association with the dynastic regime. And so, when uh, the Cultural Revolution comes along, uh, there are another set of strange inversions. For example, the insistence of cultural autonomy for a religion that actually does not originate in uh, Persia or Iran. So this is an import, but now there's, there's suddenly an insistence that cultural autonomy is the only way that this imported religion can actually be expressed. Uh, uh, another one of the uh, strange uh, kind of uh, inversions is the notion of top-down and bottom-up. So we have uh, a regime from the top-down insisting that there is a kind of amateurism, uh, which is a bottom-up expression, and somehow these two worlds are meeting in a kind of strangely uncomfortable combination. I'm especially fascinated by this official uh, parcelization of space in which the amateur can occur. So uh, I was very interested in those wonderful uh, cemetery shrines in the necropolis, which have an industrial steel shed above them, which I think is supposed to be kind of invisible. We're not supposed to actually read that. But clearly, that is a sort of state artifact that's making these individual pieces of, uh, let's say, expressive practice possible. Uh, and then the generation of a new kind of avant-garde expression using those shrines is also really interesting, too. So now uh, these two art worlds are kind of moving again. The old avant-garde 
now has changed in its visual formula so much that it's not recognizable. Uh, you know, the new avant-garde isn't recognizable in the context of the old avant-garde in some ways. Uh, and so it makes me wonder if there is a sense in which uh, the revolutionary regime affects an amazing jump directly out of Greenbergian modernism to postmodernism uh, as a kind of unintended consequence of its intervention in, in aesthetic production. Uh, in many ways, I can see some of these same uh, mechanisms operating in the Brazilian architectural context and this notion of uh, using modernism as a vernacular form, which essentially seems uh, incompatible. Like, how can there be a vernacular of modernism was uh, Fernando, uh, Fernando's initial kind of thrust of his discussion. And again, there is an aspect of art worlds within architectural professional production that he looks at, I think, very well, which is uh, there is a kind of uh, legitimacy of the vernacular in modernism through that uh, theory of uh, uh, regionalism uh, that he discusses. And that notion of regionalism is one in which the profession essentially allows itself to look at a regional production, uh, to take it, to assimilate it as if it's some kind of raw material, to reprocess it at some kind of cultural kind of center, uh, and then to export that metropolitan uh, kind of tasteful manipulation of the regional back to the provinces. So uh, that, in a sense, that's one of the things he was critiquing, this notion of uh, the bias of the profession in legitimizing only certain forms of uh, regional production. Uh, and so in terms of uh, a kind of art world discussion, uh, I wonder if we look at that middle class production of this new kind of vernacularized modernism uh, and we, we really look at it not so much in what the profession wants to make of it uh, or wants to sort of kind of dismiss about it, uh, but what is actually being produced actually within the art world of that middle class uh, modernist home. Uh, it strikes me that a really important piece that might be missing from that presentation is what are those buildings departing from as a practice? I think that would help us understand a little more about what that middle class felt itself producing. Is it producing a new uh, kind of self-image of a modern middle class? Uh, is it a form of social distinction for that middle class trying to define itself against some other kind of aesthetic for uh, a different uh, previous middle class or maybe an elite. Um, and uh, in a sense, I think it's a really interesting way to look at modernist production uh, because it really lets us try to see that we can't really judge this regional expression from some kind of central hegemonic kind of binary is the alternative, like official modernism. Uh, in effect, this modernism is local. And if we take uh, Fernando's notion of its local implementation as a valid modernism, maybe we can push that farther and say, actually all of these local modernisms are modernism. Maybe it's a universal modernism that actually is the aspirational modernism, that is a kind of a standard that we look at those things against, that it's really an imaginary standard, that it's really this a kind of composite of these local modernisms that is maybe a, a, a different and more accurate way of documenting what modernism was. Then we would look at the you know, local modernism of the Ile de France and Le Corbusier, and then posit that against a series of other local modernisms. Um, so that's that's what I got. <laughs> <laughs>
that's precisely sort of what's happening. All these um, all these binaries that come together <coughs> don't make sense. So a monarchy, an aristocracy, adopts the aesthetics of of avant-garde form, but completely rejects the avant-garde, the subversive function of avant-garde. And um, um, uh, and then you have uh, the Islamic Republic who encourages sort of grassroots agency by the marginalized, the, the least powerful in the, in the, in the society. Um, but when, uh, so, but also it's very hegemonic. So, and when you were, when you said that, you know, there's the regimented spaces, it made me also think about uh, Carolyn Jones's argument about how the avant-garde, the avant-garde, you know, turn of the century, 19, late 19th century became, I mean, I think her argument is that it, that avant-garde became possible because it was regimented in the strict structure of the Great Exhibition. Like, so, sort of this kind of thing allows this sort of, you know, now in this grid you can do whatever, the crazy, you can do the crazy. You can be subversive in this grid. And it just sort of, I thought that's exactly what's also happening in, these, in the cemetery, where this very regimented plan and little squares, uh, factory made, um, um, then you can do whatever you want in them. And I don't, I don't know if anyone noticed, but one of the uh, this in one of the displays, the national flag was actually upside down. Um, um, so, uh, so yeah, the, these constant contradictions that then speak about, um, you know, this what is really. I mean, I think we really need to stick to this idea of the avant-garde as a subversive force. Um, and and whether its form, how it comes in, is it looks like a Corbusier or not, um, might become secondary. The other thing, if I could just say, that's so interesting about your uh, study is, you know, clearly these are sort of individual performances of a personal history, but the way they're arrayed means that they're also there for the consumption of others. And it would be very interesting to know how uh, they're used. In other words, do people compare their performance of uh, a life history and a martyr in the family with other performances of that same uh, situation? How, what kind of hierarchies come out of that as well? Super interesting. Which I think, it it's exactly what happens if you're walking down a Brazilian street. You're gonna say, you know, my, you know, you're gonna compare these uh, models, and I think it is about fitting into a class, um, uh, sort of creating a class language. And another thing I was thinking that so I am um, looking into 1930s middle class Iranians commissioning architects to create these exact same villas. So I started to think about temporality. So is it avant-garde when you're doing it in the 1930s Iran, which is, again, the periphery? Um, and it, does it become kitsch when you're doing it in Brazil in 1991? So, and that goes back to Greenberg's argument that kitsch is when you adopt an an existing classical model, which, you know, modernist architecture has become classic, and then you reproduce it as a copy, and I think he is, and said, therefore there's no subver subversion, although one could argue there is some kind of a subversion in this Brazilian um, kind of const construction men subverting the very professional architecture, saying that, oh, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> Um, this is fascinating. Introduce yourself. Oh, I'm Darcy Grimaldi-Grigsby. I'm in the history of art department. And I can talk very loudly, but... <laughs> okay. Try not to talk over. 
thank you both for really such a stimulating event and uh, material. Um, one of the things that struck me about our second talk, and I'm hoping you're in contact with him and will communicate this, is both of you, in a way, all of you, in a way, are emphasizing the patronage or the commissioning. Uh, not, not when they're inside, um, inside those containers and creating those uh, memorials. But it seemed to me in the Brazilian case, I really was struck by the question of the, of the construction workers themselves and the makers. To have it all be about the middle class rather than a set of skills that were learned, you know, when he suddenly tells us that the same workers might do the favela, the official architecture, and the middle class architecture, how else could you assume you could have a dome, Le Corbusier type dome, if it wasn't for the skills the workers themselves had, which perpetuate potentially idioms and make those idioms available to the buyer, right? So I just want to add that to, for Fernando, and I have no contact with him. <laughs> but I, I do think, in general, that question of, in, a, in the context of an amateurism conference, that question of you know uh, patronage versus making it's the making that might have a really powerful impact on what those homes look like. And what about rainfall with those roofs that meet at the center? I was, I got point, you know, were they really good in, is there a knowledge of engineering how to funnel water away from being in the middle of your house uh, when a roof, you know, how free play is it? And do the construction workers say, no way, that's a really stupid idea, let's do, um, some kind of arch. Anyway, that's all I have to add. Thank you. Seizing the opportunity. I'm Annika Lentzen, also in History of Art. And I actually have a question, comment, that's very specific to Tallinn's incredibly stimulating and challenging talk for the reasons that Greg also highlighted, that it just forces the perpetual movement of categories from up to down and, and down to up. And I'm trying to think about hegemonic populism as it manifests in these uh, visual formats. And I wanted to just follow up on one, a couple of comments and slides that you've given us about the soldiers. And I'm trying to think about the soldiers' participation in these visual economies and in um, hegemonic populism, and particularly the important claim that the soldiers are volunteers so to bring us in, back into that, those categories of professional and, and volunteer. And I just wondered if you had more to say about that idea of volunteerism. And I know in um, Iraq and Syria in this time, in the, in the time of the wars, there were actually exhibitions dedicated to soldier art, which were um, manifestly simplistic, kitschy, uh, sentimental, uh, images of romantic love. So there seems to have been this regime investment, at least the sort of comparative that I know, in a visuality that's very vernacular that seems to underpin the idea of, of being a volunteer somehow. So I don't know if you've worked through those dynamics or if that resonates in the Iranian sense and if there's anything more to say about it. But that seems like another sort of category emerging as a subsidiary or subtending the idea of hegemonic um, populism. Thank you. Um, I haven't thought about it, um, but it is true that uh, it is sort of known that uh, Iran fought the war with men, Iraq fought the war with Western arms. So, um, and so this kind of voluntary to the point that 12 years old, 10 years old were being sent, were volunteering to go to the front. Um, I don't know any, um, I, I mean the uh, martyr museums are extremely rich. I only showed that tomb, the plastic tomb that was from uh, Tehran's uh, martyr museum, in which you do have artwork by soldiers. And then you also have which is very similar to the blood at, uh, uh, at the cemetery, you actually have uh, the 
um, destroyed body of a soldier in the museum. So again, you see the actual reel of the reel there. Um, so there is a very direct relationship between the soldier, his art, his body, his presence, his uh, anthropological, his glasses, his pen, his um, uniform with bullets and blood on it in the museum and museumized um, as a larger discourse. When you say the reel is there, are you talking about the photograph of the reel? No, like his body. There's his actual body. There is a, there is a, that like a destroyed body in a coffin. Thing. Or something. Yes. So, okay. and wow. there's a, there's a whole sort of narrative. It turns into an art object. Um, and it is displayed next to other anthropological and art historical art objects. Mm -hmm. yeah. Could we move the microphone to the back? Margaret. Uh, <clears throat> Margaret Crawford from Architecture. Um, both of these were very fascinating uh, papers. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I thought they were both extremely fascinating and uh, illuminating and uh, very well done. But coming from another discipline, I'm just wondering about the amateurism because they're both so, as Greg mentioned, really embedded in um, disciplinary and in the case of architecture professional discourses. And I'm still really wondering about the amateurs and their motives and what they're thinking and how they see the aesthetics. Because I'm just kind of surprised that these categories like kitsch um, or critical regionalism are operative here. And it seems to me that there's a need for perhaps some kind of ethnographic investigation of the people who are doing this and why they're doing it, rather than situating them in these existing categories um, that are not necessarily um, illuminated really by, um, by those categories, to tell the truth. Um, so it just, I mean, the whole question of amateurism is so fascinating and so exciting that um, I want to know more really about the amateurs and the Brazilian builders. I think that probably the construction methods that are shown there are actually highly determinative of what you can afford and how you can build and that modern, modernist construction methods are much more difficult to implement with conventional builders. So I think there is so much more to be uncovered about why these people are doing it, how they organize it, how they think about it. Uh, and, it and so I think when you're discussing amateurism, we're not actually finding out that much about the amateurs. to women who are making these displays. Even if you what even if you are speaking their language, there is no language to actually come sort of you ask, so why did you just pick a um, blue heart uh, gift wrap? as the background, or why did you put your son's image here instead of here on the second step? There's no, I mean, the conversation constantly slips and goes somewhere else. It goes on, you know, my son was a good boy. And, I mean, there's, there's n neither on my part nor on her part, there is a common language to actually create these, this other categories to understand what they're, what she's doing. I mean, the only way I can read them is through my own training, which the, and and then sort of question myself or undermine my own categories. Um, 